Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. How are you all doing today? My name is Nora Asha Gurum, and I'm the Director of Product at Macnet. We are building the infrastructure to make cross-border payments as easy as local payments, and our APIs help businesses to collect, to hold, and to move funds globally. I'm super excited to host for, to be your host for today's learning session on launching your remittance business in the U.S., where our speaker will be sharing tips and tricks we've learned over the years to get you ahead in the game. I see a lot of familiar names here, so lovely for you to join us today. Our virtual doors are still open for your friends, for fintech innovators, for fintech founders, money transfer operators, and cross-border payments enthusiasts in general. So feel free to share the Zoom link and we will let them in. I believe we already have a few participants and we have limited seats. So um, the sooner, the better they join. However, we will record the program. So if you're interested, if you registered beforehand and you were interested, um, then we will share with you a recording after the session. So you can go back and review it yourself or even share it with others that might be interested. Again, it's so nice to see so many of you here today. <clears throat> Can we do a quick roll call on where you're joining from? Just say hi in the chat and where you're um, where you're at right now. Let's see. Don't be shy. You can say hi to me. Oh wow, we have someone from California from New York, from Kenya, from Nepal, from Finland. Wow, it's a diverse pool of participants here. This is so amazing. I know I'm. we're all very excited to get learning, but before that, just a few house rules for everybody. You can turn on your camera. We'd actually love for you to turn on your camera so that we can put faces to your names. But please, please, please keep yourselves on mute. We do not want to hamper the speaker's audio. Number three, apologies in advance. If we do get disconnected, um, there might be technical difficulties sometimes, sometimes like in the beginning of the webinar today. But if we do, please rejoin the Zoom link. We'll restart right away. Number three and number four, send us your questions um, if you have any during the um, sessions. You can type them in the chat box and we'll answer them during the dedicated Q&A session after our speaker segment. If time allows, we might even take questions, um, live questions and open the floor. And lastly, we'd love to know your key takeaways from the session as well as additional insights. So if you're taking down notes or posting on social, don't forget to use our hashtag for today, which is hashtag MockNet and hashtag make it MockNet. So now moving on, today's session would be all about remittance and to just to get a feel of the room, uh, we're running some polls. So there are a few questions that we'd like for you to answer. Who here has ever sent money to another country? And who has built a remittance product? So take a few minutes and let us know so that we can know who all has joined, what is the, just to get a feel of the room and um, the kind of knowledge that we should be sharing today. If you do not receive the poll, feel free to just send a message on the chat box because Zoom seems to be having some issues today because I'm getting a few messages that says that they're not getting the poll up on their, um, on their end. Okay. This is good to know. Looks like most of us have some idea about remittance whether as a user or someone who's been in the ecosystem for a long time. And there are also some people who do not know about remittance. So if that's the case and you'd like to learn more, we can always share resources to get you started. So 
uh, just shoot me a message and then um, I and then I can connect separately after the session's over. But today, our speaker will provide a general overview of the trends in the remittance industry, challenges to start a remittance service, or even um, embed your remittance in your existing product ecosystem, and just ways you can do it. Um, there will be a particular focus on the U.S. <clears throat> Once this speaker segment, segment is over, it will be, um, there will be a Q&A session where we will be diving deeper into topics that are of interest to you. And if time permits, then we will take live questions from our participants. I'm super excited to be introducing our speaker today. Um, I hope that you're ex in excited to get to know our speaker as well. So let's get the show started. Our speaker for today is the co-founder and CFO of Magnet, Jay Dahal. A virtual applause for Jay. Welcome, Jay. Thank you for joining us today. Please introduce yourself. And yeah, the floor is all yours. <clears throat> um, hey, guys. Thank you, Nora. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, my name is Jay. Um, and you can see my quick resume on the slide. But what people don't know about me is the reason why I'm so passionate about remittance. It is not just because of its market potential, but because I've seen how many lives it holds. I moved to the U.S. from Nepal 16 years ago. After coming from a developing country, I know how crucial remittance is for the economy and most importantly for its people. I have seen it firsthand. Established name charges a ridiculous amount of money in every transactions. At the heart and soul of remittance, whether it's for people or businesses, you know, it's still people. After 16 years of being here in the U.S., we have seen how that problem could actually be solved. And that's why we all start team here at MockNet, because we believe that people deserve better, should have options to start remittance services. But how do you do that? Before we get there, a fun fact, I used to offer myself a brick and mortar P2P remittance company is an agent enabling Nepalese diaspora to send money from US to Nepal out of Berkeley, California. Some of the co-founders of MockNet have hands and experience building consumer facing limited business either it's a digital or brick and mortar we're really thrilled to have you all here today with us we hope this webinar will be both informative and engaging let's dive in so the question is why be in remittance first up what does even remittance mean a remittance is a transfer of money from an individual from one country to another individual in another country Remittance provider helps you send money internationally. Remittance industry has seen a significant growth in recent year with global remittance flow predicted to reach estimated $930 billion plus by 2026. This is huge. The growth has been driven by factors such as increased development of international migration, the expense of digital technology, COVID definitely amplified it, and the developing development in the global economy in general. So Dilip Rata, if you know the leading economist and head of migration remittance at World Bank, who is also called the Oracle of Remittance, has done extensive studies on remittance and foresee a growth of remittance flow to be about 5% in 2022 alone. The top five recipient countries for remittance in 2021 were India, Mexico, China, Philippines, and Egypt. Um, Angela Strand, the partner at A16Z, Anderson Horowitz said, Everything is fintech. What I think is everything is cross-border fintech now in this global world. Cross-border payment technology today has tremendous growth opportunity. When 150 plus trillion dollar moves annually through cross-border commerce. More and more we do this here at Market for every company that wants to provide payment capabilities and add a payment product feature to serve their global customer and is starting from remittance. But who can actually add remittance to this existing business model or start one? Pretty much any digital business who wants to provide cross-border services to their customers. Looking at the chart below, as you can see, before the Russia invasion of Ukraine, the remittance sustained a strong momentum in 2021. The remittance flow to low middle income countries gained 8.6% to reach $600 plus billion. It's huge. It's massive. Remittance are major source of external finance in these low middle income countries compared to changing FDIs, official development assistance, and the portfolio investment as you see in the chart. In the recessionary year of 2020, remittance proved to be very resilient and was and is a major source of international financing for developing and underdeveloped countries. So um, 
how do you start remittance business in the U.S.? I think the million dollar question is, how do you start and be compliant remittance business in the U.S.? So if anybody has tried to Google it, you might see two things. One, you know, the bunch of random words and jargons, very boring, confusing, uh, get complicated pretty quickly. The other interesting thing is it might lead it back to us. I'm just kidding. On the serious note, we think there are four key steps in building remittance business in the U.S. As you see in the slide, the first one is the industry. And I think this is not a brand, no brainer at all. When you start anything, it's always relevant to know what you're getting yourself into. Think of it as a learning to swim for the first time as a kid. Before diving into the ocean head first, it's always safe to practice in a smaller and more controlled environment like a small pool, maybe three feet, two feet, whatever that is, a comfort level. How many times we talk with potential clients who doesn't understand remittance, at times get hyped up with the industry, excited seeing venture funding in the similar industry and wants to start a business. I would say it's not a good reason to start a remittance business. It's very plain and simple. General rule of 101 in business. What problem are you solving? Is it a real problem? No matter how big the industry is, if you don't have a specific problem you're solving in your mind, your business problem is bound to fail. Sorry to say that. Um, how many people are going through the similar problem? Probably these are the answers that you wanted to, uh, sorry, questions you wanted to answer first. Who are you serving? Nothing worse than an unclear client persona. If your target market is everyone, I would say you got to do more homework. How are you going to compete with the incumbent? What is your core value and what is your mission, right? And theory and the cake, learning to speak the language of remittance. Every industry has a lingo and jargon, jargons. So does remittance industry. We are not a friend, right? Um, people get used to over time and the goal is for it to make sense for you. Um, some of the acronyms for, I think, the word that we can say is, is what its center means, what its beneficiary means, what does KYC means for you, what's MTO, MSB, CIP, what is correspondent bank, what's MTO license mean, what does agent mean? What does pair? You know, all sorts of bunch of random letters put together. What does that mean to you? You should be able to, you know, understand the language and lingo of the industry. Figure out what they are and why they exist. Okay, one seamless plug. I do break these jargons down in our LinkedIn and Twitter account. So give us a follow and learn more. Um, so let's move on to regulatory and compliance. I think remittance is amazing. You know, we love it. But also it's a complex business. And this does not mean to scare you but it means to ground you. Is it doable? Is it worth pursuing? It just comes with few things, not all fun and exciting, like, you know, licensing and regulations, but I mean, don't every best company in the world come up with a little complexity? I'm sure it does, you know. You know, running a big tech company had some complexity, but it's just the fun of doing it, right? So, so let's dive into detail regulation and compliance. If you want to start a remittance business in the US, you will need to apply for a money transfer license in all US 50 states. Once you get the license and money transfer, you need to go get the bank account for the deposits. Once you get that up in a payment processing partner, a letter user fund the account via a card network or a bank account, and then build a compliance program for KYC, AML, and find a licensed partner in the beneficiary country where you can pay out the transactions. <clears throat> I, this is all mouthful. I know I have a good news for you. Later on in the webinar, we'll talk about how to skip this complexity and start a remittance business without all of the above. We just discussed, so don't go anywhere. So now let's go to funding. It's, it's a fun piece, I love funding. Once you have got one and two cover, interest and regulations, let's go a bit deeper. <clears throat> Do a market research and understand the addressable market. What do you want to cater the services? And who is giving the solution at what rate? How much are they doing it for? Most importantly, raise some money. I'm serious. And I'm talking about at least hundred to $150,000. Um, building a remittance solution is not cheap. It's very compliant and regulated business, which means you will be spending about thirty to about fifty thousand dollars, give or take a year, on SaaS fee, another fifty to hundred k just to push the market out the door uh, for sales and marketing. Because you got to compete with your niche product and provide value that you're going to bring into the users. If you don't have that kind of money yet, better get it uh, because it's far fetched to build a business without the capital, right? But I know you said, Jay, you just said that any digital business can do a business. I know, I understand, I heard you. Um, I said that, um, I get it. And we're getting there. The good news you already have, if you have an existing business and digital ecosystem, you can start the business, you can start the business with, without really investing a lot of money. 
And if you, so for example, if you need to offer a global payout solution, which should cost you about 30 to 40,000 a year, give or take, because you already have existing user base and you're just offering a cross-border commerce via remittance for your existing user base. Okay, so let's talk about territory now. Fun fact, <clears throat> remittance only works and it's very simple if there is only two parties involved, so one sender, one receiver. So know where you want to send the money and where from, right? But when a user sends money from the US to, to sell, let's just say, for example, we take Kenya as an example. We have somebody in Kenya in our webinar today. So then you need to understand the regulations and licensing requirement of Kenya too, uh, because money remittance, how the end user receive the money is compliant ecosystem. Money remittance only works compliantly if you comply with both sides of regulatory environment. As mentioned above, understand where you want to originate and where you want to settle the transaction. The key word here is focus. Focus on the corridor. Also, for the sales and marketing effort, so you, you have to have a niche territory to validate the market and scale later, right? So if you see an example in the real world transfer wise, which started US to UK corridor first. first. Moreover, licensing is a critical part to understand while choosing the right territory. Now we ticked off all the things that we needed to do to start the remittance business. Let the fun begin. Let's discuss, can you start offering remittance services now? <clears throat> we'll discuss each of the three types of ways you can do that and the challenges you might be encountered potentially building either way. So let's dive in. So first one is DIY. So technically, you can do it yourself. It's possible. Should you do it? I mean, you know, your, your time could be spent better elsewhere, to be honest, if you don't have a, enough funding in place at the beginning. Because sure, it's a great way to learn how to build a remittance as a service product, but it's also very expensive and time consuming if you go to DIY route. It's the best way to learn how to build a remittance business, but very expensive, it takes a lot of time. I definitely personally don't recommend a startup who have next 12 to 24 months one way in their cash flow. Let's talk each of these items. Uh, first off, uh, let's go with licenses first. As discussed in our prior slide, you need the US MTL license, which is a money transfer license, another acronym. Um, in order to have regulatory coverage to onboard users, cross-border remittance industry is subject to complex regulations, which I call it a spider web of spider web of rules and regulations, either at federal or state or even international level, because you are doing cross-border here. It is the most expensive and can take long time to obtain license for both the larger states such as New York, California, Texas, because it can take a couple of years sometimes, at times, right? Again, choosing the territory is important. So if you are starting a business in some state, you can start with few state licenses to kick up the services and go from there. Most important in doing this, navigating the regulatory landscape can be very challenging and failure to do so can result in penalties. And then don't be afraid there could be consequences to go jail time as well. So I'm not even kidding. Um, there are a lot of consequences in this. <clears throat> the second piece is banking and payment processing. So once you have a license, you need to set up a bank because you got to get the money from the user and put it in the bank account to move money, right? Um, unfortunately, coming from our experience, there are not many money service friendly banks in the US, I would say. The bank like to sometimes play a chicken and egg problems where regulators will tell you to go get the bank account and the bank account will tell you, bankers will tell you, go get the license first. So the reason in this industry is very complicated because there are a lot of de-risking happen, starting with the MSP friendly banks post 9-11, Patriot Act, and the major de-risking happen after Operation Choke Point in the city by, started by DOJ back in 2013. So DIY is definitely an option for you to learn, but certainly comes with a lot of challenges. Um, another piece of compliance. I can't stress enough about compliance, and I know my our compliance head can always vouch for me on this. While you're building a remittance business in the DIY model, you will have to hire a compliance person. You need to have a whole stack team of compliance to build your know your customer program, which is also called KYC, anti-money laundering program, AML, to adhere with the state monetary licensing requirement. It also applies to maintain your bank account because you're a license holder now, right? You have responsibility. Everyone in the MSP business has to go through this money laundering training course. Now, here it comes the legal kids, and you gotta pay the lawyers too, right? To, to make the compliance business. So there's something you need to carefully draft and run the program. Um, Third thing, I think technology, we are in the technological world now. So all in all, you cannot do this in paper. 
Uh, you, know, you have to move the money. You need to build the technology where you're able to compliantly onboard the users, fund the account, perform compliance check, do a last mile delivery, sitting on the web application or a mobile phone or on a desktop computer. However, you want to let the user experience your product, right? That's why it's very important for you to build a really rock solid technology that's compliant. At the same time, it's user friendly. Doing all of this is a huge undertaking for DIY model. Um, lastly, payout, I think I touched this that on the territory as well, as discussed earlier, choosing a territory while running the DIY business uh, is very important. You need to determine what market you want to pay out your transactions, at what FX rate, depending upon an arrangement, you can partner with a licensed entity or MTOs or banks uh, that you can pay out transactions with benefits in destination country yourself or in a partner with one of them. So, you know, overall in nutshell, I think DIY definitely has upside, but major challenges, uh, that is how expensive it can be going through all the tech build, everything from scratch, partnering with you know, 15, 20 vendors to build very compliant business model. It can take multiple years for go to market. Time is something that's limited for everyone. You know, you know, DIY might be a great build for a remittance business if that's the route you wanted to go, but it certainly comes with sets of challenges. Uh, so the second one is being an agent. Okay, now if you're thinking, I don't want to do this, what else can I do, Jay? What's behind the door? Um, the second option is to be an agent of existing MSB, uh, another acronym, money service business, or FIs, or financial institution. And the upside is you're off the hook from all the licensing and regulatory processing because the entity you're building should have already done all the homework. So you choose to be an agent. Here's how you do it. Uh, you can be a brick and mortar operations, which is also called it a traditional business. When you're an agent, you're practically signing up users on behalf of licensed partners and collecting remittance fund from people, depositing them to the established financial institution or MSB's account through vault or going to the bank account. This is an example I gave in my intro earlier. I used to run a brick and mortar operations back in the days and I was an agent of MSB. As you can see on the slide, the customer goes to an agent on behalf of FIs and MSPs and FIs and MSP will do a last mile delivery to the destination country through agents of the respective um, continent or country. So if you ever wonder why some of the gas station says or some of the you know brick and mortar operations is accredited Western Union or MoneyGram or RIA partner or other MSP name, that's why, right? In the developing countries where the funds get settled, they're also licensed uh, in the respective countries. And this is very much prevalent in everywhere in the underdeveloped or developing countries where funds get settled. The agent model is still has to, has to do some work. Um, we'll have to collect the funds uh, from the sender. So an agent will have to do some uh, homework around gathering documentations to process and turn it over to the partner entity who does all the heavy lifting on licensing. It's for marketing and getting people's trust. Partnering with the big entities matters because they would have already done all the household name work. So people already know them and that's what they do. So they already have built the trust for the brick and mortar operations. But like anything else, there is also a downside. The biggest one is it's being limited because you don't own a brand. They are limited on what can you do on their behalf. There are limited on how can you market it. You'll probably have to comply with their guidelines. You'll also have a revenue limitations because you're functioning under their umbrella in a physical location. Remember that brick and mortar operations. And with COVID, we kind of saw a lot of things going away from those physical location or location centric stuffs. Another hurdle you might want to consider is the digital competition, right? Uh, like I said earlier, unless if you are in the developing countries, most of the counterparts may already have digital op options. And then that is more convenient for now post COVID. So let's dive into the next option. Digital money transfer. The second way to offer remittance as an agent is through digital money transfer agencies. Similar to the brick and mortar operations, because you're piggybacking on an established entity, the licensing challenges are already taken care of for you. So the user will sign up with an agent via online dashboard and the FIs and MSV sometimes and it can take funds directly to the receiver if they have you know bank accounts set up on the destination country, which doesn't happen always. In normal cases, FIs and MSV will partner up with the licensed entity in the destination country to pay out the transaction. As an agent, you can also build your own user interface for your customers via mobile app or web application, given that you, know, you comply with the license holder disclosure requirement. That's what the compliance is all about, right? And the regulated industry. This option is perfect for those who already are set up digitally and those who want to try it out first. And if see, 
they're like, because this requires little capital can, can easily be done. Being an agent is also regulated as you are an agent of a licensed entity. So your headcount to maintain the compliance might arise. Um, but you know, if you feel like you need more room to grow faster pace in this space, you do not have a third, I mean, you, you do have a third options for you. That is partnering with the RAS provider. So as you can see in the slide, if you look at the DIY and RAS that I just spoke earlier, the slide might look similar to you, but here you are joining hands with the RAS provider who is going to take all the heavy lifting and the compliance, banking, payouts, and overall technological stack for you to start the money services businesses. So working with the RAS provider will let you acquire customer the way you want it. And also you will be providing the first tier of customer experience and service so you can be, give them the best user experience digitally possible. And that's what you're good at and that's what you wanted to do. That's why this is a phenomenal way of starting a remittance services. Out of the other two we have discussed today, partnering with a remittance uh, provider or RAS provider is probably the most effective way or cost effective way and faster ways to launch the money remittance services. I'll highlight a few benefits working with the RAS provider and which are as follows. One is compliance. So since the RAS provider is doing all the heavy lifting, you don't need to acquire money transfer license for bank sponsorship for customer onboarding uh, to start the services. The compliance part is taken care by the RAS provider. Isn't that amazing? I think so. Banking and payments, these services are very challenging and costly whereby a RAS provider will provide these services to you. So you don't have to worry about it. Getting banking and payments can be very tough in money transfer operations. I think I said that earlier on operation choke point after 2013 and DOZ intervention, it has become very difficult for the money transfer operators to actually get a bank account, right? And it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. FX and payout. So given RAS provider will have the integrated solutions for you to manage the FX and payout, you're focusing on acquiring customers and it's scaling the business. So I would say, you know, RAS provider built everything for you from starting from compliance, banking, FX payout, and all the technologically stacked, partnering with all the vendors that it's required for them to run a compliant business. You can go, go out and market the business yourself and then I start acquiring users. There are some challenges, but at the same time, these are something you might also want to do it because you're building a brand with the RAS provider, right? So what you have to do is you build a small tech team yourself. So you'll need to have a small development team to build your applications, either it's mobile app or website and maintain it for your customized user experience. Highly recommended it, by the way. Unless if you're using the white label solution or the solution provider is going to manage the service, which is fine too, because you're gonna be focusing more on customer acquisitions and then it's scaling the business. So either way is good. I mean, it is a bit challenging because you gotta maintain and you know bear the cost and whatnot. But at the same time, I think, uh, it will help you scale faster. The second one is assuming the risk because you know you might also have to assume some level of risk and return based on your risk appetite. By now, I hope you understand some you know important increases behind getting into remittance business because it is risky, it's complicated, but you know the RAS provider kind of make it very simple for you. But you know there are certain aspects of risk that you probably have to assume. And then I think this is more of a subjective, but you know finding a right remittance service provider is also important because someone who you know shared the vision, someone who shared the uh, your idea of where you want to take it um, product is, I think you need to you need to in, in line with the RAS provider. That's how I really advise you to talk to, to all these questions that you have. So you don't have to regret the relationship to start over again. That's about it. So thank you all for bearing with us, but I hope that this is very informative and then we'd bore you all. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send your question in the chat box to the host. We'll start a Q&A session, and I would like to bring Nora back up, Nora, so we can you know, pick up and talk about a Q&A from audience. Thank you, Jay. That was a great overview to get our discussion started. Um, I particularly really liked how you framed um, the options that right. um, businesses that want to start with remittance have the DIY, um, the agent model, and then uh, working with the remittance as a service provider, right? We have a few questions um, from our participants already. So I'm going to get started with those. So okay. the first one, 
The first one being jail, like you mentioned about like how the remittance ecosystem is growing. It's continued to grow despite the pandemic. Yes, there was a slight dip, but it's bounced mm -hmm. back. It's seen, it's a lot of people talk about how resilient the remittances was mm -hmm. more than they'd expected it to be. And the thing is that there are a lot of incumbents in the market that have these big players that have dominated the market for years and for decades, right? Um, some are even like household names that we hear all the time when we walk out, we see their logos everywhere when it comes to remittance. So why should anyone enter such a crowded market? Like, is there any space for new player, players? And like, based on your experience, um, how can um, small players even compete with such established companies? Yeah, no, thanks, Nora. I think that's a great question. So I have a husband that is coming from investor group. So to answer your question, the short answer is there is a clear problem in the ecosystem and there got to be more innovators and mission driven founders to get engaged and address this huge market. Like I said earlier, 150 plus trillion dollar moves globally uh, through cross border trade. And the next is the fact that the World Bank has always advocated for the sustainable remittance target fee of 3%, the amount sent. And you know what currently the fee range is? It's about seven to 10%. If you think about hundred billion dollar moves, you know, the billions of dollars are actually paid on just the fees alone. I think there is a huge problem and one that legacy and the established businesses can't fix because it is still there. The fees hasn't gone down much. So we need, we need, like I said, we need innovators and mission driven founders to solve these problems. I mean, I know why is remittly Western you know, are doing a phenomenal job in certain corridor, but even if, if you get a tiny percent of the markets here, that's still a lot, a lot of money to be made and cater services to the end clients, right? Basic supply and demand TT system, the best way to lower the fees is through, comp is, is through a competing competition to make it happen for you. So if I am sending remittance, there's only three things that I care about. FX, fees, and the user experience. And the beauty of this industry is you don't need to reach huge market. You don't need to go every single corridor, right? You just need to be able to go deep, you know, know the particular customer segment enough so that you understand their social behavior. You understand their sentiments, priorities. So yes, definitely it's a crowded market, but definitely have a room for more players and new players to come. And then still a lot of underserved communities and countries around the world. Again, Ruska can share a link of the World Bank data that one of our clients who is a local player competing with established one because they didn't need to worry about all the compliance tech in the RAS provider can already cover a lot of heavy lifting for you. So you can compete in FX, you can compete with the fees, and you can compete with the best user experience for your you know, consumer, right? Another way client can do is not just do a remittance services, can add more values providing bill payment services, mobile top-up services, so we want a B2B services on their existing rails. So, being in this space doesn't necessarily mean you'll, you'll have to do it everything. But as providers shouldn't make you feel like trapped in just one business, they should make you feel empowered to do more with their clients. So there are a lot of players in the market, I hear you, I hear all the time, but doesn't mean you can compete with the best of the best. You can definitely take even established company with lower cap. And the keyword here is hyper-localized services because we have clients based out of Kenya, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Nepal, Armenia, uh, China, who you know, who provide and who provide services to those local diaspora people by providing hyper localized services, right? And then it's and they understand what their customer segment wants. So again, you know, just in nutshell, hyper localized is a cure here. Going deep into the specific diaspora and provide the value services. There is enough business in the market. Right. So I think I definitely hear you when you say hyper-localized and how that adds value and that adds, um, that allows new entrants to really compete with um, the established companies and businesses in the space. But you also mentioned that um, customers are price sensitive, right? Um, the FX matters to them, uh, better fees matters to them. So, mm -hmm. And what we see is that big players have the money to burn. They have money to burn for customer acquisition. They have money to um, invest in licenses and that allows them the flexibility to um, do what they want in terms of um, the business that they want to build. 
obviously they need to be regulated, regulatory compliant, um, and they have economies of scale to their advantage. So yeah. it seems that when you, for new entrants, like doing yourself seems like a lot more work and a lot rigid business model because you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be as agile and you wouldn't be able to uh, kind of cater yourself um, according to the evolving market. And then when you are an agent, it seems like you're collaborating with an incumbent rather than competing with them. So I hear you when you say that ROS providers, working with ROS providers is an option, but can you el elaborate more on um, the kind of value that ROS providers bring to the table, especially for new entrants, mm -hmm. and also maybe even for established businesses that um, are having a hard time competing in this space? Yeah, I think that is a great question because, you know, I think we kind of talk in detail about DIY, agent model, and RAS provider. Um, you know, out of three ways to get into the remittance, remittance business. So the, the value prop does the RAS provider bring in is in three folds, right? First and foremost is RAS provider bring access to business. That means the cost of doing business yourself with high fixed overhead with, and that can easily be converted into a cost-effective monthly SaaS fee. This is one of the best part of working with the RAS provider. Remember, we talked about if you don't have licenses, if you don't have processor banks, you need to go out and get it. And it's a hefty fee that's getting involved. You know, we did some research around cost about a million plus to get licensed a couple of years just to get going in this business. So, you know, these costs are kind of quickly turned into a SaaS fee by RAS provider. Uh, which is super important. I think this is one of the biggest value props they're bringing to the table. The second one is they will give you, give you pre-built tech and regulatory infrastructure. So what that does is this will replace all the partnerships that you have to go and get yourself, all the integration that you have to go and do yourself using a single API. So you don't have to do the heavy lifting anymore because the RAS provider give you everything in one API, right? And then lastly, is the, is the best part is you can go faster, go to market with the scale. To scale and grow your business, you will need resources. You know, nowadays resources are super, super expensive. So when you partner with RAS provider and make them your launch pad to go to market, you can scale your business without really scaling an internal team because they are the one who is managing the relationship with all the vendors. They are the one who is managing all the relationships with the FIs and MSVs. They are the one maintaining the compliance. They are the one maintaining the regulatory environment for you. On top of that, it's not just a one-time build. They're actually maintaining these for a long period of time. And then your sole goal is a client would be just to scale the business, acquire more users, scale the business and provide first layer of customer service, like you mentioned, right? So that's why I think it's super crucial for them to scale much faster in this RAS model. Right. So... Uh, one of our participants is actually asking, um, can you share more on RAS providers currently in the U.S. market? Obviously, Magnet is one of them, um, but there are quite a few in the market already. So can you share about some of these enablers that are out there and then so that our participants can Google them and get their <clears throat> research started and also maybe on some of the services they provide? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think... There aren't many players, unfortunately, enabling a lot of businesses that needs to be, in my opinion, uh, because the market size, like you mentioned earlier, it's huge. And there are only really few players that are actually consuming this huge market shares, right? The few names come to my mind. Uh, one is Rapid, which is led by Eric. Uh, Neom, led by Prazid, doing phenomenal work on cross-border commerce. Uh, Currency Cloud, which is acquired by Visa, recently doing some work in this space. Uh, TransferWise, uh, which is wise now, it has some borderless API offering as well. Uh, Bugsy, BrightFi, uh, you know, there are a few names that comes to the mind. And then all of them, much of the companies that I mentioned, either, you know, focused on large scale enterprise or B2B large ticket size transactions value. I'm not saying that they don't you know, cater services to the startups and whatnot, but, you know, that's their focus, right, as far as we know. Um, but, I mean, there are only a few players uh, that are providing a launch pad for a startup who wants to get to the market on a very cost-effective way. Like you mentioned, yes, market is one of them, but I'm not trying to sell market here, but there are options. There are a few options, not like a lot of them. And also there are some MSBs, the one that are licensed in like few states or multiple states who are doing some valuable mission driven work in this space as well as enabling some MSBs. 
Okay, so so if anyone was to get started, I know someone's asking, what would be your tip on what the first thing they need to do? Yeah, so you know, if I, I think we can go back to our slide, right? So if anybody wants to start remittance business, they need to understand what they are doing and what the value proposition they are probably bringing to the table to a customer. Because you know, you mentioned it's a crowded market; it's a very competing market, right? You got to be able to provide the value. What is your needs customer segment? What is the value prop you're bringing to that needs customer segment? So they want to go with you. They want to come sign up with you and start remittance services. Um, you know, the quick answer would be just to go back and understand your industry, understand the regulatory environment, find out which territory that you wanted to go with, right? And then, you know, how do you want to start? Either you want to do it yourself or do you want to be an agent or, you know, go provide, you know, start partner with a RAS provider. I think just pick one of them. And then if you don't have a lot of money to do it, then, you know, I would say just pick RAS provider and make them a launch pad and get going, right? I think that's probably the first right. way. And then a cheaper way to, you know, if, if you think, I mean, not every startup succeeds, so it's probably the fail fast and then, or, you know, in a scale fashion, so whatever you want to do, but RAS is the you know, way to go, I think. Right. So I think this is one of, there's a more technical question regarding RAS providers. Uh, we talked about the DIY model and how that was um, more focused on getting coverage yourself, right? In the agent model, you were talk, we were talked a little bit about like piggybacking off of MSB's licenses. So how does RAS yeah. providers um, provide regulatory coverage? And um, maybe you can share Magnet, uh, Magnet's work as well in this regard. And to add to that, um, in the US, you need licenses in every single state to do money transfer. So um, how does the RAS model cover every single state that's out there in the US? Yeah, no, great questions, by the way. I mean, normally the lawyers ask this type of questions, right? So, no, so Magnet is a financial technology company. So we have partnered with various banks, agent of banks, financial institutions, and various other service providers, like I mentioned about tech providers, right, to provide our remittance as a service program. And then the banking service of our program are provided by federally charter banks. And they have all the appropriate charters and licenses at the state and federal level to provide banking services. This is one of the reasons that, you know, we made this very compliant so that, you know, our clients does not have to go out and work with the regulators or work with the you know, lawyers to, to build this for themselves. So, you know, again, we also have an in-house counsel, an external counsel that will work with us on a regular basis. And they gave us an opinion about, about our ecosystem to make it very compliant. Uh, that in line with the regulatory requirement, not just today, but in this changing environment, you know, how everything is changing every single day. The new laws comes in New York and California or Texas. And then now we got to, you know, update our system to make sure that disclosure requirements are met. So, yeah, I think it, it's very compliant business uh, to make it compliant, you know, partnering up with these, um, our partners help us to make this, you know, very compliant. Yeah, that's great that, um, everything's compliant because I think, as you mentioned before, that's one of the biggest things with being in the remittance business. And that's where a lot of the resources and the time um, is spent. Um, so yeah. I totally agree with you on that. Um, I know we're a little bit short on time. So uh, we're, we have around like 10 minutes left. So I think we'll take one more question. In, and that is... Let me see. There's a very interesting one. I never expected to, for this to arise, but what are the challenges if you want to exit from a remittance service provider? Definitely that is something oh. to consider and like a good question because I think um, for various reasons, whether you want to exit, whether you find some other remittance provider, um, this is something that you might face when you work with other partners and this dependency can be a good thing sometimes. Sometimes it can be a bad thing. So uh, what's your thought on that? Oh, this is this is a good question, Nora. I'll tell you that. Um, so we we don't get these questions more enough from our clients, but I think it's a really important one because someone is thinking about it early on. Usually, these type of questions come in whenever you know they want to exit, like you mentioned, if they want to find a different provider, if they have M and A, or exit, or maybe it could be any other reason, right? So when a RAS provider is enabling a company, they are empowering them. You know, <laughs> sorry. Think about this keyword, it's empowering them and enabling them to build their business brand, right? And that's not going away. 
brand and users are their asset and they should be able to keep it. They work hard to acquire it and to build it. If you are an existing business or if you're exiting, then you are going to take the brand with you and your migrating should be as seamless as possible. What we need to be mindful is, you know, I think I'll go back to my funny stuff like our license and regulations here. You know, there are certain information that you as a FinTech can hold, can access and take it with you because for a regulatory reason, you know, fun fact about, you know, which world we're in living into it. So for this reason, you will need to understand what can you keep such as your, you know, user's name, address and whatnot, but you can't take it is something that your ask provider can give it to you because of regulatory reason. But by the way, love the questions though. You know, early on in the negotiation, in agreement negotiation timeframe, you probably wanted to talk with your vast provider. So it, when that will help you on the future plan, either taking it, your brand somewhere else or getting into a deal or for any other reason, right? So make sure you ask these questions early on. So that will be my take. Nice. So Jay, I think that was the last question for today. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you so much for everybody for participating um, actively and for asking questions and listening to Jay and his uh, wonderful insights. If you have more questions that we weren't able to address today, um, please feel free to email us or even message us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, we will also share Jay's Calendly um, in the chat box. If you want to book a time to discuss your use case with Jay and really um, pick his brain a little, we will um, be sending out the recording of this webinar after the session. And if you have any topics of interest to you, then feel free to respond to that and reply and send us an email. And we will dive deeper into those topics in this. Uh, upcoming sessions. This was definitely our first webinar and we are very excited that you joined us and thank you again for making time and um, joining us this morning. And thank you to Jay for shedding light on the remittance industry and how we can conquer it. I hope everyone learned as much as I did uh, wherever in the world you're joining from. And um, that being said, my name is Nora and it has been a pleasure hosting today's session. Have a good day and uh, if you're somewhere where it's 